from ABC News Radio, KMET, 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I'm your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today we have coming to us a author, entrepreneur, speaker, and uh, general game changer, Jonah Sachs. Welcome out to the show. Thanks for having me, Tyler. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Now, I've been doing a little bit of reading about you. I mean, we're going to talk about your new book, Unsafe Thinking, and how um, and the, the interviews and the things that you uncovered in preparing for that book. Uh, but as I was looking back in, in a lot of the stuff you've done, you've been running a storytelling digital marketing agency to really bring about like social awareness. And I realized that one of the um, a, a video that really impacted me several years ago uh, is actually something that you'd worked on called the story of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That was such a cool thing. How, how did that happen? Um, you know, we had been experimenting since 1999 actually with how you get people to take a message that they believe in and pass it along. And how do you take pretty boring social change messages and make dress them up so that people will want to share them. Um, and so that was before YouTube. Actually, Story of Stuff came out even before YouTube, so people weren't even necessarily sharing that much online. And this woman, Annie Leonard, came to us who was passionate about garbage, basically. And she's like, everyone needs to know where garbage comes from, and I've got an hour and a half talk about it. And we're like, yeah, no one's going to want to know for an hour and a half about their garbage. But um, you know, we had a lot of theories that she also was kind of working on at the same time about how you turn to complex topics into stories. And when you do people kind of forget the complexity and the kind of boringness of it or the negativity of it, and they just engage if you do it right. So right. Uh, we turned that thing into a 20-minute lecture. It was actually one of the first uh, animated whiteboards. You know, that style became very popular after that. And, um, you know, we, we, we made it all about not the garbage, but about Annie's personal journey through shopping and styles and fashion and then garbage. And right. uh, we got like 30 million views in the first year it was out. And, uh, you know, people weren't even sure what it was because at the time, you know, internet video was a novelty. Right. Um, but it showed me how important it is just to tell those compelling stories. You can have all the facts that you want. Uh, it doesn't do much, no matter how clear those facts are until you really dress it up in a powerful story. So, yeah. And man, that's amazing. <laughs> you said so many things in there that I would love to unpack and we'll hit on a couple of them. But the, just the thing that you said, internet at the time, internet videos were a novelty, right? <laughs> and now it's like, not only, it's a necessity for any, any brand or any message that wants to get out there to be able to use videos and tell compelling stories, right? How, since that time in 1999 yeah. up until now, how have you seen, um, even though the mediums have changed or evolved or grown up, how has that core essential base of needing to be able to tell stories remain the same? And what's most important in that? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think in the early days, storytelling on the internet was more similar to what you might've seen in Mad Men or the old days of broadcast. You know, you really package up a message. You've got plenty of time to think about it. You maybe once a year, you make a really powerful video and that you hope that it spreads, you know? And like I said, Sometimes we would get tens of millions of people watching these things. You know, sometimes we work for six months and we get 50 people watching them, you know, you, but you, you would craft that message and you tell that story. Now what's I think happening is just the ability to create so much media and our audience is being so overwhelmed by it. Um, you don't really want to go all in on a story like you used to. What you get to do is realize that the, the story is a, it's almost like a container. You get to define what the story is about as you know, think of your whole brand as a story and you start, these are the discussions and this is the chapters of the story we're trying to work on. This is the moral of the story we stand for, but you got to recognize that that story is going to be told over every channel, over thousands of conversations. It's going to be told by your audience members back to you and you don't just get to tell it with, you know, that one great 30 second spot. So um, in a way it's more crucial than ever in this world of noise and bifurcation that we um, come up with powerful stories, but it's more like it's a grand epic that's unfolding over every conversation we have, not a, uh, a single metaphorical perfect ad. So in many ways, that makes it even more important for a brand or a company to know their message because they've got to be telling it daily as opposed to just crafting it once and pushing play. Yeah. And, and if you don't know what your core story is, your core message really is about, 
you know, you're going to be chasing what, you know, Twitter wants at that given moment or what Facebook wants. And you know, oh, we got 5,000 likes on this thing. Um, you got to be really careful though. Cause if you're getting a lot of volume on something that really has nothing to do with your core message, I mean, for every like and click and view, you're not going to, you know, very small number of sales. If you're trying to create a, um, you know, a loyalty and a, in a connection with your brand, you can't just be going for volume. You've got to be going for authenticity. And so I think in some ways it's more important than ever to get that message straight because you're going to get, you're going to get distracted by all kinds of data points. Um, and you don't want to get too pulled. We've had a lot of, I've had a lot of projects where, you know, you do something that's hilarious and then everyone spreads, but nobody notices the brand and you're like, Oh, we shouldn't have done it that way. You know? Yeah. It's funny how often that happens. You see an amazing commercial and you're like, what was that even for? <laughs> yeah. You know? And it's like, it was good storytelling, but it wasn't, it, it forgot the meaning, be, the reason behind it all for the yeah. brand at least. Okay. So, um, I think we could, I could dive down that road for a long time and I would love to talk more about it, but tell me and help me define unsafe thinking and let's go from there. Yeah, so unsafe thinking is the opposite of safe thinking. You know, it's when we want to change and we know we have to, but we just get pulled back in every circumstance to wanting to do what worked before, to those comfortable patterns, to, you know, de-risking. Unsafe thinking is that ability to break out of your patterns, to, you know, defy conventional wisdom, especially your own conventional wisdom, you know, because we just, we are creatures of habit who want to, you know, fall back on the lessons of the past. But the world is changing so quickly that we really have to challenge ourselves to change with it. And unsafe thinking is not just about going out and, you know, sort of saying to the world, no, I'm not doing it your way. It's, you know, saying to yourself, no, I'm not doing it my way. I'm doing it a whole new way and experimenting and trying new ways and using that whole brain. Um, we often let, leave parts of our, our psyche out of the picture because we get really good at one or two things. How do we expand and break those habits so that we're, you know, far more nimble? Is the idea of unsafe thinking. Okay, cool. And so a lot of it comes down to even to challenging our own assumptions or our own, uh, you know, ideas that we had before we, when, when we started perhaps a project or a business or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you interviewed a bunch of people and kind of used their stories uh, to kind of illustrate this point and people that maybe demonstrated unsafe thinking. Uh, give us an example. I mean, I'm looking at a few of them, but tell us about, you know, how unsafe thinking can help you you know, either bounce back from failure or, um, or take risk. Yeah. So, um, I interviewed for this book, uh, a woman named Julie Wainwright and she is famous by it for being the, uh, ultimate internet flop. She was the CEO of pets.com when uh, pets.com fell apart, you know, pets, pets.com was no worse than any other bubble business, you know, right at the turn of the turn of the millennium. But they had that sock puppet that everyone knew and everyone found annoying and, you know, became the poster child for dot-com failure. On the same day that she had to close her business, her husband left her as well. And, you know, reporters were camping out on her lawn. It was this enormous failure that had such a deep imprint on her psyche. When I met her last year, she was running a billion dollar online consignment store uh, called The Real Real, which, uh, you know, most people haven't heard of. Everyone's heard of Pets.com. But right. she came back and failed twice more before building this business. And, you know, in understanding her story, it really comes down to the fact that the human brain is primed to take these deep emotional experiences and overlearn lessons from them. You know, success and failure is really based on a combination of our skills, our ability to learn, and then a lot of luck. Unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs will see these high emotionally impactful experiences, you know, a lost sale, a project that goes off the rail, a business that fails as a um, giant warning sign. You know, Wainwright didn't do that. She had lost everything, but she was able to then have a much more realistic assessment of her own skills and belief in herself to go and take yet another risk. And instead of learning the cautionary tale of the past, she actually pulled out the two or three things from that experience she knew could make her stronger. One of the ideas from the book and one of the big parts of unsafe thinking is that um, anxiety is a natural part of creation. And that if you are doing something that's not making you nervous, you're probably not being that creative. Every innovator feels anxiety. You can't, you just, there's nobody who's so brave that they go into this arena and they don't feel it. But the ones who tend to succeed are the ones who have reframed it as fuel for creativity. They move towards it rather than seeing it as a warning sign that they're getting off track. And so, you know, you really have to fight the natural impulses of your brain in a lot of ways to do all of this. Uh, partly because, you know, anxiety on the 
the African savanna where we, uh, you know, where we evolved was a sign that you had to run because it's probably lying there. But in business, it's not like that. Anxiety is a sign that you're pushing into new territory. You shouldn't always do the thing that makes you anxious, but if you never do, you're probably trapped in safe thinking. Absolutely. That's, uh, I love that, that you said that entrepreneurs turn, uh, tend to overlearn, right? Meaning they take, they take something and they apply a, more meaning than needs to be applied to it. Uh, yeah. And so it's like, well, that didn't work in the past. Therefore, that can never work as opposed to what were the components that, sh- that were good? What were the components of that that were bad and what needs to be adjusted? Um, and and that, uh, Julie's story is a phenomenal example. And what, what's interesting is, like you said, her new story may not be as well known or as mainstream, but it's highly, highly successful. Yeah. Uh, that, that lesson also doesn't just apply to our negative failures but it also applies to our successes. So um, if you can't overlearn from your failure, you also can't overlearn from the things that have worked. So there's all these studies of experts and uh, experts tend to you know, have deeper knowledge, more experience, and also be more blind and wrong about the future the more that they've attached their ego to that identity of experts. You know, One study I looked at studied 20,000 expert predictions over 20 years. They were worse than dart throwing monkeys. And the ones who were you know, the worst were the ones who were on TV the most and were being quoted in newspapers the most. And the reason for that, the researcher explained to me, was that, you know, you start to see everything in the environment as just a new flavor of an old problem. Oh, yeah, I've done that before. I've learned that lesson. I'm going to apply it here. And the world has changed. I mean, the world changes every, you know, (laughs) every month, it seems. Uh, So if we overlearn the lessons of our success, we start to think of ourselves as experts and we start becoming closed to the signals of the environment because our ego becomes so strongly attached to what we know. Uh, Really, the learning happens when you jump into your areas of ignorance, not keep, you know, talking about what you really know. So can you be an expert in unsafe thinking? (laughs) Uh, so there's there's a uh, dynamic that I was exploring with that where, you know, there's this idea of the beginner's advantage. I think a lot of entrepreneurs love the beginner's advantage because I don't know anything about this industry and I don't have to, I'm going to come in and I'm going to disrupt it. Um, the reality is that people who make massive disruptions actually have quite a bit of skill. They have expertise. Uh, they understand what's been tried before. They understand the rules of the game. They, they get it, right? But they're not entrenched in one way of doing it. So they're passionate about learning. You get to a certain point of learning where you get more and more powerful at creating innovation. And then you can go over the U and you know, start going downhill into entrenchment. The trick seems to be to you know, passionately explore knowledge without ever believing you've attained it. So I call it being an explorer rather than being an expert. That's so you know, fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Cause I think once, once we, you know, drank our own Kool-Aid or so to say, once we say I'm now the expert and that learning stops yeah. and that willingness to admit you're wrong stops, I think that's the beginning of, of the, uh, the descent, right? So, um, yeah, man, absolutely. I think, I think that's great. And I think be, being an explorer in this space is a, a great way to explain it, right? Both in, in exploring for knowledge and also exploring uh, what the next opportunities are. Yeah. Um, what are, who are some of the other people you interviewed? Maybe who was the person that uh, surprised you the most? Well, I, uh, I spoke with Steve Kerr, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, my hometown uh, basketball coach, and uh, really learned a lot from his story. Um, because, you know, everyone looks at what he's done with that team and it's like, this is, you know, great, but he's got these great talented guys and, you know, maybe he's just coasting along. He told me his personal story, which I found really fascinating, which was that as a, uh, as an NBA player, he was one of the best three point shooters in the league. He didn't tell me that, but you know, that's the truth. And, um, he had this feeling in his mind that he didn't belong there, uh, that if he took an important three point shot, he was probably going to miss it. And everyone was going to realize that he didn't belong in the NBA. So he would pass up the big shots. And it wasn't until Michael Jordan had a flu in a game six of the finals and he had to take the last shot and hit it that he suddenly realized, like, yeah, I belong here. But when he became a coach, he re- recognized that the guys on the team, no matter how good they were, they were, were under this enormous pressure. And his job as a leader was not to increase that pressure and let them know the stakes were high and, you know, push them to their limits, but first to give them that psychological safety that they belonged in this league, on this team, that they were safe. And that at first broke my whole thing. I'm like, no, no, we're not talking about safety here. We're talking about unsafety. But, uh, you know, I try to push that idea away. But the more I sat with it and the more we talked, it gave me this amazing idea that that Kerr has used, which is the concept of the the locker room versus the arena. That if you want to be a great leader in a fast moving venture, getting creativity out of your people is not about creating this no rules, wacky environment where anything goes. You actually have to have that you know, that freeform creativity, 
But that comes from first creating that locker room where everyone's valued and safe and well can, taken care of and you're rewarding not just results but you know good process and good um, teamwork. And when you do that, then when they go out onto the floor, you can have them beat each other up and fight over ideas and take big risks and they come back. And I think too few companies and individuals understand that as leaders. Um, that you know, make it safe for your people to get unsafe. And if you're not getting enough creativity out of your people, it's not that you don't have creative enough people, it might just mean that there's not enough psychological safety within your organization to really pull that forth. So that was a big lesson for me, especially running a creative agency. I was like, oh yeah, you, know, you can slow down and make it safe so that you get more creative. And that's a hard, hard lesson to learn. So you could almost say that like uh, Coach Kerr has a, uh, his own hierarchy of needs, right? Like if, if your team, feel safe and they feel secure within their team and they know the structure and everyone knows the strategy and the game that they're going to play together, then there comes a point where they can start taking risk together and playing aggressively within that bounds, within that realm. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, so, and that, that sounds like a tough balance to figure out in general for anyone. Like when am I, when am I practicing unsafe thinking or when am I being reckless? Cause that, they're not the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, you know, what is reckless is when you are in a position where you know you need to do something radically different, but you keep putting it off and doing the same thing again and again, right? Uh, that's reckless. It's true. You don't want to over-index on always choosing the unsafe path. You know, we need to follow patterns. We need to follow rules so that we can get anything done. Otherwise, we're questioning every possible move. But unsafe thinking comes in, and I think we all have this somewhere in our mind. You're like, I know we're still doing the same old thing and I know that will not work forever. We have to actually move, but you know, it's, it's two 30 and we have to send out some emails. Let's just, you know, we'll do this later and you just never do it. This kind of part of my own story, actually kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation was started this agency in 99, just out of college, you know, just having fun basically. And, um, started exploring the storytelling thing. And it was, we were getting this, you know, great successful movies that people were passing around, inventing something new. But what happened in that is the company grew quite a bit to like 40 people and I got asked to give a lot of talks on storytelling and to write a book about storytelling. How do you do it? And so I made a system up and I used that system to become an expert myself, to get on stages and tell people how it's done and also to sort of make my company do it the, the way that we were supposed to do it. Right. And I could tell that one, the world was changing so quickly that we couldn't just keep doing the same thing, even though everyone wants, you know, our clients wanted to buy it. And two, that we were just becoming less creative. It was less fun. And, you know, every day I had a pile of projects to get through and a pile of sales goals to try to, you know, to achieve. It was never easy to say, well, we got to change tracks. But I knew we were going to go over a cliff if I wasn't going to make that action. And I didn't actually learn how to make it until I talked to 100 innovators and read all this science and wrote this book. But, you know, hopefully... Now that I've done that, other people don't have to go through the same three-year process I went through. But yeah, making that change, even when, you know, even when you know you have to, is very hard. Yeah, and I mean, it, there is that beginner's advantage, right? Where you don't realize the challenges are ahead of you, so you believe everything's possible. But when you're into a company as long as you've been, right, you, and you're running it for some time, and, and you've got to make a change, and you also have to make sure that all 40 people are ready to pivot and, and the boat, you know, ride this, this turning boat with you, um, you know, what kind of changes are you guys making? Well, so we kind of really did a lot at the time um, to kind of scrap the creative process and make it m that we were using and make it quite a bit more sort of flexible and sort of guidelines to, start to change the whole incentive structure about, you know, how we were bringing on clients and doing sales to being something more about, you know, rewarding creativity and bold change and innovation rather than kind of cookie cutter stuff. Um, and you know, as you said, a lot of people dig their heels in and, you know, we couldn't keep everybody on the team as, as constituted because a lot of people were really brought on to do the old way and love the old way, even though it was no longer working. Right. The biggest thing for me, you know, the biggest unsafe thing for me was after I made that transformation, I was pretty exhausted having, you know, gone through that 17 years in, you know, I was a different person and very excited about, uh, the science of creativity more than making, you know, internet stories. And so I actually sold the company at the end of that process, which for me was the most unsafe thing I could possibly do because I had built my whole identity and life around it. So I don't know if that was the right move, but certainly when I asked myself, you know, what would an unsafe thinker do next? That's what, you know, came to me. And so I've been moving more in the direction of, uh, you know, freeing my creativity, which has been an exciting process, but, you know, anxiety. Yeah, fascinating. Well. I think, uh, I think you highlighted something. There's, there's like serial entrepreneurs, right? They're, they're always starting companies. And so their identity doesn't necessarily attach to the company as much right. as other things. But 
for a lot of entrepreneurs um, and business owners, the business and being the president or the CEO or the leader of that company is who they are. Right. Uh, and so like now being, um, having to, you know, change your business cards and change things up. Like how did that person, like how are you shifting your identity from being the leader of that into what you're doing now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in so many ways, you know, I, I mean, I have to have conversations with myself almost every day to say, Hey, this thing that grounded me and anchored me and became my litmus test for whether I was succeeding or failing and gave me everything in my career is no longer what I'm about. So what am I about? Um, that puts me back into that, you know, fast growth learning curve, which I love. Um, but it takes me away from that uh, stability curve, which is also, you know, kind of nice. Uh, yeah. So uh, for me, it's now it's just a process, actually. The writing of a book and this going out and speaking about it really is just the beginning of fascinating conversations. And I'm trying to take every conversation that I have and, you know, doing some consulting and speaking. But more than doing those, those things is turning these conversations into opportunities to learn uh, and be able to listen to the questions people have and say, oh, like, this is just the beginning. Those questions are what I now need to be able to answer if I want to continue to be useful. So um, playing with it. And I would just say that for me, um, I think that I got trapped because I did one thing well for a long time. And it was almost impossible to imagine what would come next. I think you get better once you've done two or three or four things. Uh, about knowing when to move because you don't see that there, you know, you know, there's a future beyond whatever particular thing you have right now. So it is a getting on a track at 23 and riding it to 40 is a particular challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs actually do face. And uh, it's interesting to see where they go. Absolutely. So um, you've got a lot. I mean, you, your your books published out there. It's fun because I see the ads on it too, and then you know I'm seeing it in my feed. So you're you're doing that. You're out there speaking. Um, you're in that process of kind of redefining your next few steps and what, you, who you are and what you're doing, um, what blind spots are you worried that you're going to miss? Yeah, well, I think probably for me, the, the biggest obvious blind spots are come around um, kind of understanding core purpose versus seeking and finding opportunities that, you know, might take you off of that, but that are, you know, exciting and interesting nonetheless. Um, and I think that that's just always a part of the entrepreneurial journey once you step off of a single track, which is uh, the world opens up, there are lots of ways you can take it. Um, and uh, it's always tempting to sort of to be, I'm in that explorer phase, I'm going to try everything. But I'm also very well, well aware of how quickly you know, you get sucked into somebody else's problems and someone else's organization and that starts to hold your focus. So really that kind of, um, you know, how do you manage, for me, is like, how do you imagine the excitement of new opportunities versus the core purpose that you're out pursuing? Um, and I've never been one of those like simple core purpose guys. Like I've got the statement, I'm going to follow it to, to the death um, because I kind of like to be more flexible than that. But also I am having a lot more problems uh, managing my time than I used to, where I used to get up and I'm working 60 hours a week and I know what I'm doing. And I was like, how do you manage opportunity in a smart way? And how do you follow it to your, to your greatest success, not just to sort of filling your space and time, which is very tempting when you first get off the treadmill. Well, you hit, you know, managing it to your greatest success versus uh, managing it just to, you know, the lowest levels. Or how do you even define success, right? Because what I've always found is there's this amazing paradigm shift that happens, right? You think that you meet somebody, you have an, an, and you hear, for example, right? You have an agency and you hear, okay, they're doing 10 million a year. That's now like where we start to define things. Then you meet somebody else and they're doing 100 million a year. And everything shifts to what success is, right? Yeah. And I think that can be dangerous as well as really, really positive to help us grow. Um, how are you, you know, what have you noticed through your research in just terms of like learning to define success or set goals? You know, I've, I, one thing I learned from my research is that, uh, I'll, I'll say two things. One is that uh, we are motivated so much as human beings by role models. It, into a ridiculous way, we create identities and we try to live up to those identities. Those are kind of internal role models. And those are often reflections of outside role models. And so I like to ask myself, and I encourage everybody else to, when you're looking at someone and you're kind of jealous and you're like, oh, I want that $100 million level. I want, um, it's better not to look at the business and say, you know, how do I get a business like that? It's better to look at the individual who's running the business and right. try to find the person who you want to be and the experience that you want to have and then investigate more deeply how they got to that point, not sort of how the business got to that level of success because you'll find 
um, some really smart, amazing businesses that fly well under the radar where the person is, you know, living their best possible life as an entrepreneur and other businesses that like appear to be thriving and are famous and are just a nightmare for the people who are trying to run it. And so, um, you know, one really kind of humanize that, that um, role model I think is really important. And the second thing is, you know, I studied flow theory for this book, which, you know, probably a lot of people know about, but it just says that our joy and intrinsic motivation and value comes from doing things that, that take our skills and push it to this, to the, that match it to a challenge that's just beyond that level. It's why people will play like Candy Crush all day because there's no purpose to it, but it's just like, oh, it's just a little harder than I know how to do and I'm always learning. And so uh, if you get in flow, no matter how much money you're making or how much esteem you're getting, uh, there's all the science that shows that we just enjoy our work to an enormous level. So it doesn't replace the idea of success, but just asking more day-to-day, moment-to-moment, does this work put me in flow? If it does, you're more likely to be successful and you're more likely to enjoy the journey. So um, two things go together, but really prioritizing the journey as much as sort of the result and, and seeking flow, I think are helpful for finding what you want to do next. Yeah. Flow is an amazing thing. And I'll have to ask you offline for some suggestions on, uh, on what to read on flow theory. Cause that's a, that's yeah. been a big thing for me this last year. And you mentioned right at the beginning of that, that really a lot of it came down to finding people to model more than just necessarily the businesses to model. And I think that humanizing that and remembering that business is all about really the lifestyle it's going to build for us and the freedom or opportunities it's going to create as the individual. Um, that's really everything for me, right? Everything for me is uh, how can these businesses help me live the best life that I want to live? That, that, those are the ways that I personally define yeah. success, right? And so yeah. what is, uh, what's something on Jonas Sachs bucket list that you're going to do here in the next 12 months? Oh boy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have wanted, I've been telling stories and writing stories and dealing in stories for clients forever uh, and writing business books. You know, this is what I do is use words in this way uh, and crafting these stories that hopefully change people's lives. Um, but I also have two kids and we've been working on all kinds of, you know, fictional stories that have just been these endless adventures for us. And, um, you know, I don't know if I'll ever, ever publish them, but it's on my list to actually create some story worlds that, um, you know, get out of the, get out of the nonfiction and into the play. Um, even as I do other kind of creative projects for other people, I kind of want to do some of those for myself. And so I'm making a little time every day to capture these stories and, and write them down and, you know, maybe start down that road for a little professional work as well. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming out. I encourage everyone to check out Unsafe Thinking by Jonah Sachs. You can go to jonasachs.com to learn more about Jonah. Uh, You can find uh, Unsafe Thinking anywhere books are sold, you know, all over the internet and even some of those brick and mortar stores. So thank you for coming out, Jonah. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Tyler. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.